Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Jesus Fernandez Villaverde. Jesus is a professor of economics at the University of Pennsylvania, a research associate with the National Bureau of Economic Research, and a research affiliate with the Center for Economic Policy Research. Jesus specializes in macroeconomic modeling, economic history, and more. Today, he joins us to talk about COVID-19, central bank digital currency, and developments in the Eurozone. Jesus, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me again. Well, I'm glad to have you back on. And as I mentioned, you do a lot of interesting work in very different areas. So just to remind our listeners, you were working on a huge economic history book last time we talked, and you were near the end. Have you finished that? Well, (laughs) it was not so close to the end. Oh, okay. (laughs) <laughs> no, but I I brought a very nice chapter on energy and the and economic history and global economic history. I got very interested in uh, the very central role that energy plays in economic history, and uh, that took me a little bit longer than I wanted. And then, actually, right before the crisis in the fall, I was writing all the chapters related with demographics and climate and plagues, which turned out to be the case, surprisingly. Great timing. Et cetera. I was really planning to make a lot of progress this semester. I had a very, very uh, light teaching load this semester, and I really hope to have something ready by the end of the summer. But, you know, life has changed for everyone. So uh, hopefully I will, I will have more time during the summer. Yeah, we'll get you back on the show to discuss that. But what's fascinating to me is you're doing hardcore economic history. And this is a huge book. And you've done other work, too. It's not the first project in economic history. But you're also doing very serious macroeconomic modeling, getting published in top journals. And I mentioned this in the last show. And you had a great counter reply to me. But I said, you're the one data point that gives me pause about the idea of comparative advantage. Yeah. (laughs) Because you know what? (laughs) Because <laughs> you, you excel at both. I mean, most most people have to specialize either in being like a deep macroeconomic theoretician or an economic historian. You do both. Of course, your response is, well, maybe I'd even be better at one of them. I focus. Yeah, on. exactly. <laughs> maybe who knows? Now everyone will be using the Villaverde model everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. So, so listeners, if you want to check out his webpage, I encourage you to do so. He's deep into models, deep into history. It's a great mix. And makes you a better macroeconomist, I think, if you do have that rich understanding of history. And we talked about it on our last podcast, so we'll put a link up to that for listeners to take a look at it. But along those same lines, you seem to be doing a lot. I mean, you're doing history, you're doing macro modeling. You mentioned you're get, you got into demographics. I saw that paper preparing for the show. So you and Chad Jones have a working paper out where you put on your epidemiology hat <laughs> You take your mm-hmm. take your modeling skills from economics and you apply them and, and you, you help finesse an epidemiological model. And so the paper's title is Estimating and Simulating an SIRD Model of COVID-19 for Many Countries, States, and Cities. So walk us through why you got into this and then what did you find in this paper? Okay, so back when I was a graduate student, uh, one of my teachers was Patrick Quijo, who is now a professor at Stanford. And one day he told me something that I remember um, as if it were yesterday. He told me, if you want to learn about something, you need to write a paper on it. Um, So this is early March. The wall, as we know it, it seems to be coming to an end. I want to know a little bit more about this stuff. So I get myself a couple of textbooks on uh, epidemiology. And I see this model. And I thought, well, why don't I write a paper about it? You know, worst case scenario, I will just make a mess out of it. Best case scenario, I may learn something. And um, so what have I learned? So there is this very basic model called CIRT, which I imagine many of your listeners are already familiar with, which is basically susceptible, infective, recover, death model. You have different groups of people that switch between these different compartments of the population. And we take it to the data. And a couple of interesting things that we do is we apply some of the standard tools in econometrics to take it to the data. And basically what we find is, one, 
uh, some evidence of the effects of social distancing. We think we find quite a strong effect in many countries, in many cities like New York or Europe. And we also come up with, a, I think, relatively reasonable measurement of how much we can relax now uh, social distancing. Um, and our main point is that if you are in New York City, you can probably relax uh, quite a bit because, you know, yesterday uh, we had some uh, testing that suggested that maybe as many as 21% of people in New York City already had the infection. Uh, it may be a little bit more even today. And also uh, some of the probably worst cases of spreading have already been taken out uh, from the data, while uh, in places like California, they are far away. So in that sense, I think that uh, one lesson that at least I get out of my from my paper is the one-size-fits-all policies of some European countries do not make a lot of sense. And there is a lot of regional heterogeneity. There is a lot of space heterogeneity. And any sensible policy needs to take account a little bit that Wyoming and New York City are very different societies and very different levels of infection. Okay, very interesting. Now, you just finished this paper, or you just put it online, so I know I tweeted it out yesterday and today, so it's probably too early to ask if you've got any feedback from it, but maybe, let me ask the question this way, Jesus, what do you bring to this model that's you know value added for an epidemiologist? Maybe an epidemiologist hasn't seen what, what we have to offer, so what do you add here that, that adds a new perspective? Uh, I would say three things. One... Um, econometrics is about fitting relatively complex models to the data. And economists as a profession have been thinking about this for 70 years now. And that's an important aspect. We have thought a lot about uncertainty. We have thought a lot about how to assess where the model may fit the data well, where the model may not fit the data well. And those were challenges that in natural sciences do not show up that often. And the reason for it is uh, my, my undergraduate professor of econometrics always made this point. An electron doesn't change his mind about where to go because the policymaker is have some plan about the future. Agents change their mind about what to do depending on what policymakers are having in mind. And epidemics are social events. It depends on the behavior of people. And the behavior of people is not fixed, it's endogenous. And econometricians have been thinking about this endogeneity for many, many decades. Um, that endogeneity is not a big issue, usually in natural sciences. So maybe economists have something to add uh, along that dimension. The second thing where I believe we can add a little bit is economists um, have spent a lot of time thinking about parameters that change over time. In fact, a lot of my econometrics research is about that. And again, um, issues like social distancing is about parameters that change. And in natural sciences, they tend to take these parameters as fixed over time. And finally, uh, we have thought a lot about counterfactuals and how to design counterfactuals when people, as I was saying before, endogenously react to the actions of the government and we actually are working on a follow-up paper that we will deal with some of these issues. So, of course, we are we are trying. Sorry if this is getting a little bit long. No, this is great. We are, trying, we, are, we are trying to be very humble, and, and we say it in in the introduction that we are not trying to claim that we are discovering anything new. We are just trying to say, look, you guys in epidemiology have great insights about many things. Uh, we think that in economics, we also have some ideas about how to model and take dynamic models to the data especially when agents are reacting to policy decisions, and maybe there is something to be gained about talking from these two sides of the aisle. Yeah, no, I think those are great uh, contributions. As you mentioned, just, just to summarize, so endogeneity, uh, how to properly parameterize your model and counterfactuals, things that, you know, economists, that's their bread and butter. And so bringing that into a setting where maybe it's not as, as developed might be a mm -hmm. big contribution. And who knows, Jesus, this might be a highly cited paper for you just in another discipline when it's all said and done. <laughs> so. I hope. Yeah, just, just let me tell you a small anecdote, if I may. Sure. Uh, 
actually my my mother uh, when when she was working she used to work with viruses she was a she was a researcher in a in a virology lab back in Spain and we often talk about the statistics she was doing and it was very different from my econometrics and just because as I was mentioning before she was studying the virus in a in a lab and over there endogeneity time varying parameters etc never play a role so the type of statistics she was using was, was very different from mine and that's why may I, I may be a little bit more aware of those differences yeah so you had some background some context with with your mother's work and then i mean it's impressive that you you would sit down and open up several books on you know epidemiology that's that's much more ambitious than i think most economists would be so that's that's great and uh, i hope your paper sees a lot of uh, light and lots of exposure, and we'll do our best to promote it here. We'll make a link to it on the webpage for the show today. Okay, I want to ask a different question. So we're still on COVID-19, but I want to maybe ask you kind of a broader question about this crisis. And and my question to you is, first, is it appropriate to think about our response to this crisis as fighting a war. So you, you might have some people who see this as garden variety recession, maybe a real severe recession, but just a, a collapse in e- economic activity, apply normal you know, measures, fiscal policy, monetary policy. What, where another way of viewing this is we're fighting a war. We've got to be all in, willing to, to you know, do things we don't normally do and that includes running up the debt, maybe tolerating a little more inflation than normal. We should be willing to do that. Do you think it's fair to view this effort as fighting a war? And I ask you, because you are an economic historian, you've studied plagues, you've studied wars. Is it a, a proper way for our policymakers to think about the current situation? To a large extent, yes. The way I put it is as follows. Uh, think about your garden variety recession. Most of those are problems from demand. So think about 2007, 2008. You have a problem that the financial crisis burst and people just don't want to consume too much. So a standard answer is either through monetary policy or through fiscal policy, we can induce a higher aggregate demand and you basically fix the problem. And the situation now is a little bit closer to a war. Because the problem that you have in a war is that suddenly you take 10 or 20% or even 50% of your labor force and still of producing pencils or books or things that we like, they either need to become a soldier or they need to produce weapons, which we don't like in themselves. And that's a little bit the situation we have now. Suddenly all the restaurant workers cannot work or can work much less. And even if the government comes and says, I'm going to give vouchers to everyone to go to restaurants, that voucher is useless because you cannot go to a restaurant. So it's about more how we reallocate people within different sectors, how we get the productive capacity back to normal. And in that sense, that looks much more what you are doing in 1942, right after Pearl Harbor, than what it looks in 2007 right after the financial crisis. At the same time, you also want to keep in mind that whatever action you take needs to be sustainable in the long run. And your answer needs to depend a little bit of who you are. So in the US, I'm much more optimistic about the ability of the federal government to sustain large programs that, for instance, I am in Europe, where a lot of countries were already much closer to borrowing constraints. Yeah, like Italy, I imagine you, you, you're thinking of it this time. And we'll come back to the Eurozone a little bit later in the show, if time permitting. But yeah, that's my framework too, and I think it's a useful way to, to think about this. And you know, I, I think some of the concerns that some people are now bringing up, so I think early on there was, there was unity, there was, there was definitely raw, raw team, let's go, let's do everything we can. There are some cracks beginning to emerge in this this consensus we had early on in terms of policymaking, and they've, you know, they're around the amount of debt we're incurring as well as potential inflation. But my thinking is again, you got to keep the vision straight that we're fighting the war. But secondly, even if you, you th- want to start thinking about the numbers, it's true we're running up a lot of debt. But I also see the evidence risk aversion is through the roof as well, and probably will be. There's, there's, you know, literature on how when people live through a really s- severe crisis, they tend to 
take that with them. People who live in the Great Depression tended to save more afterwards. And I think you may see something like that coming out of this crisis. So it's it's not clear to me, at least, that we are at the point where we should really be worrying excessively about inflation on the horizon. I'm less worried about inflation. And in particular, I'm less worried about inflation because it will have the quote-unquote right redistributional issues or consequences. What do I mean by that? We know that the coronavirus has very, very different consequences for younger people than for older people. So by shutting down the economy, in some sense, we are making a gigantic transfer to the older generations in the economy. The person who's 25 years old and she loses her job is implicitly transferring resources to the person who now is 75 years old, getting a social security paycheck and being better protected against the coronavirus. So a little bit of inflation that will erode the nominal assets and the nominal income of those that are a little bit older will benefit the real income of those who are a little bit younger. And in that sense, any strategy of getting out of this crisis needs to think a little bit about those intergenerational transfers. And I'm concerned about this because it was already the case that when you look at most countries, including the United States and the Eurozone, most of the adjustment of the financial crisis was done by relatively younger cohorts. And that's the reason I think many people in their 30s are very unhappy in the political process right now. And what we cannot really add is people in their 30s to pay a second time for a large crisis in less than 15 years. I don't think the political system will be able to, to accept that. And a little bit of inflation will go a long way to redistribute the losses across generations, I think, in a little bit of a fairer way. Yes, it's particularly tough to be a millennial. You cut your teeth, you you hit the labor force during the Great Recession. Here we are a decade later, and you're going through another very severe, maybe one of the worst that this country will go through when it's all said and done. And, and you speak to a, a framework, actually, that, that I like, and that is countercyclical inflation, which does tend to provide a more equitable outcome. And we'll come back to that a little bit later when we talk about your papers on central bank digital currency. But in general, are are you happy with what you're seeing in terms of what Congress is doing, what the Federal Reserve is doing? Are they being aggressive enough? Should there be more grants? I mean, one critique I have, I, I again, this is the fog of war. They're acting quickly as they can. You know, there's political constraints. Um, but one thing I do see that that does concern me somewhat is that Congress and Treasury, they're, they're really trying to leverage up the Federal Reserve's balance sheet and try to do a lot of heavy lifting through the Federal Reserve because it's effectively off balance sheet. It doesn't count towards the debt, even though you and I know from the consolidated balance sheet perspective and in terms of real resources, it, it's, it doesn't really matter who does it. But it's, it's a way to avoid making tough decisions, it's a, a way to avoid you know, increasing big numbers to the debt. And I would like to see Congress do more direct spending, maybe more grants, as opposed to going to the Federal Reserve, which is constrained by law to do lending without losses, to use to, to target firms with good collateral. So it really t- ties the, head, the, the hands of the Federal Reserve and what it can do. And I think Congress should, should address this problem head on and, and be intentional and clear about what it wants to do. That would be my kind of big critique of what's been done. Again, I acknowledge this is the fog of war, and sometimes it's hard to move quickly, and they're doing the best they can. But I wonder if you have any kind of broad observations about the policy response so far. Okay, so uh, I have a lot, so I'll try to sure. to constrain my verbosity and try to summarize. Okay. <laughs> so first, uh, looking at both sides of the Atlantic, I think the U.S. is responding better. And I know there is a lot of criticisms always in the U.S., but I think that in general, and the U.S. has taken a little bit more of a, of a sensible position. Second, I'm very sympathetic to your argument that Congress should take a little bit of a more of a leading role. But I will argue this has been the case for the last 20 years, that for a number of reasons, Congress has been delegating a lot of its power to administrative agencies, or in this case, to the Fed, because the political system right now is in a crossroad where it's very difficult to get Congress to do anything. So given that, the optimal response 
is probably to go through the Fed. Not in the sense that it would be the best that we could do uh, in an abstract sense, but in the sense that this is actually what can be done during this month. So in that sense, I'm a little bit less pessimistic perhaps uh, than you are, but you are absolutely right. Who knows? Maybe in six months, I will have changed my mind. Also, I, I think that one advantage that uh, doing this a little bit through the Fed is that we need to react uh, as things change during the summer. The Fed may be a little bit more nimble than Congress. So that's buying us a little bit of flexibility down the road. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think that the Fed is definitely nimbler. Than they they have the, the staff. They have the capacity. I mean, Treasury's got very few people working for it. The SBAs we've seen, it was overwhelmed by this response. The IRS, I think in general, the state capacity in the U.S. isn't where it should be for a crisis, but no one could see this coming. And, and I agree, given the political constraints, the Fed is the solution for now for most of the heavy lifting. But in an ideal world, at least, we'd want to see Congress doing more. Yes. Uh, it is interesting that you mention a state capability. I actually wrote an op-ed uh, like a month and a half ago, ago precisely about the state capability. And one of the things I express concerns over there is that I see the state capability of the United States as having gone down quite a lot uh, over the last 20, 25 years. And there are structural reasons and there are more kind of short-term reasons. And that worries me. That worries me because if, uh, there are two different discussions that we can have. One is a discussion about how large the welfare state should be. And the other one is the discussion about how well should you run the welfare state. And right now, I think that the evidence is that we are not running the state very well. And you see that all across the different states. You see that all across different cities. You see that at the federal uh, level. And it's very easy to use your moot affiliation and to blame the other party, whatever the other party is. Or the fault, but I think the evidence is that you see serious lack of governance in uh, all type of institutions across the U.S. and, by the way, also across all the Western world. And that actually worries me quite a bit. So state capacity has been declining across the advanced economies, not just in the U.S. Yes, in a in a in a dramatic way, and and this is and this is a real problem. This is a real problem for the long run, and hopefully, if there is something good that can come out of this is that we realize we need to, to invest more in state capability. I actually made the following argument in a couple of occasions. Uh, COVID-19 being as destructive and as a terrible virus as it is could have been much worse. We could be talking about a virus that spreads at the same speed that this one, but is 10 times more lethal. And given the responses of the Western world, we could be talking now about tens of millions of deaths. So maybe this is a moment where we are going to say, look, this can never, ever happen again. And we really need to have a state capability that eliminates this existential risk for the future. Well, I hope you're right. I hope this is a moment of introspection, looking forward, You know, being willing to build, be more creative, plan for the future better. I mean, I, I had Alex Tabaruk on the show, and we talked about how difficult it is to plan for like tell events like this so he's been a big advocate of preparing better for asteroids hitting earth but pandemics is a very similar thought i mean another area i think that we lack that alex brought up is solar flares and our infrastructure in the u.s our, our, our grid is, is very susceptible as well um, but that's just one small manifestation of the challenge of, of state capacity not being where it should be so i hope you're right asus we will come out of this um, with our heads up and seeing more cooperation and progress in how we govern our country. Let me move now to an area that you have written on. You have several papers with some colleagues, and the papers are on central bank digital currency. And this is a great topic. We've had several guests on the show. We've done a bunch of shows on this. So I had Morgan Ricks on the show, as, as I mentioned, and you have developed a paper along with your colleagues and your colleagues are Daniel Sanchez, Linda Schilling, and Harold Ulig. And you've actually got two papers on this. You've got a paper titled Central Bank Digital Currency, Central Banking for All. And then you have a second paper titled Central Bank Digital Currency in a Nominal World. And again, this is something that we, we've talked about a lot on the show. 
And it's, it's come up also in the discussion of what else could the Fed do. So the Fed's been doing a lot of things, as we've alluded to already. It's rate, interest rates are at zero. It's doing unlimited QE, the forward guidance. It's got an alphabet soup of facilities. And what else could they do? Well, negative rates, maybe yield curve control. But this would be one big step forward. And you've thought long and hard about this in your paper And there's several big questions that a central bank digital currency brings up. And I just want to outline them them now. We'll come back and discuss them in your findings. But one, what would a Fed account for the public mean for financial intermediation? Two, what does it mean for financial stability? There's a panic. There's a run. And three, what would it mean for the conduct of monetary policy? What should the Fed target? How should it respond? What should be in its reaction function? Now, before we answer those questions, Jesus, I want to go back to your first paper, the one that's titled Central Bank Digital Currency, Central Banking for All. And you provide some rich history in there in terms of central banks allowing people to actually use the central bank as their personal bank. So walk us through the history of central banks opening their doors to the public. So if you actually go back and read a little bit about the history of central banks. This idea that the central bank is an institution where only other banks can uh, do business with, etc., is to a very, very large extent a creation of the 20th century, even more after World War II. So when central banks are created in the late 17th century in Sweden and in England, and then in the 18th and 19th century, other European countries and in the United States, they are super banks in the sense that they are regular banks that are going to do regular checking accounts and saving accounts and intermediation, but they just have some type of privilege. So, for instance, the Bank of England will allow you, had the privilege, had the monopoly of issuance of currency notes, first around London and then in most of England. Uh, the Bank of Spain had also the monopoly to issue some types of uh, notes. And the first and the second bank of the United States had some ability to deal with the treasury of the United States. But by and large, you could walk into your local central bank branch and say, I want to open a checking account and you will be able to do it. And in some countries like Spain, this was the case until 1962. Uh, In the 20th century, central banks become more about conducting monetary policy than about some type of financial intermediation. And then they started disengaging from these activities with uh, the day-to-day business people or the day-to-day households. By the 1990s, I think there was a very widespread consensus that this was the normal way, quote-unquote normal, to run central bank operations Well, it turns out to be the case that suddenly we have uh, the internet and maybe this is a moment where we can rethink that. Can we go back to the the 19th century in some sense where you could have a a checking account at the Bank of England or the Bank of Spain or the First Bank of the United States with the difference that now, thanks to the internet, that central bank doesn't need to have 10,000 branches all across the country. You can do everything through the internet. So that kind of opens a whole new area of financial intermediation. And then what I wanted to do with my papers was to think, is this a good idea or not? Yeah. And you guys have developed some models in there. And we'll talk about the findings in just a minute. I want to go back on your history, though, because you have some really neat data for the Bank of Spain. And you're from Spain originally, so maybe you had an interest and you knew about this. But I was reading in there, and at one point, the Bank of Spain had 75% of all demand deposits. Is that right? So the central bank had, you know, an overwhelming majority of all checking accounts, demand deposits in the country. And as you said, it went up through 1962. That's pretty mind-blowing. I mean, for someone in my age, the generation, you're like, wow, that's, that's hard to believe. I don't know, but I remember being a small kid walking with my grandmother and um, apparently my grandfather, which I never met, had a, a checking account at the Bank of Spain. And she was always very concerned because after 1962, uh, he had to close a checking account and use a regular commercial bank. And she was always very worried that a regular commercial bank was not as sound as the Bank of Spain. And I remember walking 
in front of the local branch of the Bank of Spain that still existed, but they didn't really do anything at that moment. And she, uh, she would always complain, oh, you know, I used to have a checking account over there. Interesting. So in that, sense, <laughs> in that sense, I had a little bit of empirical evidence from the beginning. But yes, so let me let me tell you, in fact, why many countries create central banks. And, and if you actually read a little bit of the history of the United States, you will see that a lot of the motivation between, sorry, behind the first and the second ball uh, bank of the United States was about it. Uh, banks just don't appear by spontaneous generation. You need someone who will push for that bank. And when you are a relatively agrarian economy or you are a relatively under, underdeveloped economy, you may not have the private sector initiative from the private sector to create that bank. So you may have, as a government, you may think, well, why don't we help creating this bank? And the goal of that bank is not really to conduct monetary policy, is to provide levels of financial intermediation, which will not otherwise exist. And that was really behind uh, a lot of the central banks uh, around the world. It was not, when, when the Bank of Spain is created, it's not to do you know, open market operations, it's to ensure there is financial intermediation in the country. And we have forgotten that as economists. Yes. And it's worth noting that we already do have partial access to the Fed's balance sheet or to central bank balance sheets in general. So you and I have physical cash, which is a claim against you know the Fed's balance sheet. It's just that we can't have access to the electronic version of the Fed's balance sheet. So it's kind of an artificial barrier if you think of it in terms of that. That being said, people do have legitimate concerns about what effect this might have on financial intermediation. But but it, it's it's worth considering, you know, at a very fundamental level, we already do have partial access to the to balance sheets. And as I was reading your history section, just another one other thought, you know, the first and second bank of the United States, I, I've read those histories a lot. And the second bank of the United States, as many listeners will know, was ended because Andrew Jackson did not like it. He did not, he did not like the central bank. In fact, he, mm-hmm. his presidential campaign was centered around ending the Second Bank of the United States, and he won, took that as a mandate, and he shut it down. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess one lesson for us today, you know, going forward, just to, just to be mindful of, is a central bank like the Second Bank of the United States, where people could go deposit their funds, they, could, they did have an account there, it becomes a political firestone, right? It, it beca- Andrew Jackson was upset for a reason because the second bank had this privilege and survived crisis. His banks didn't. He lost money at his local banks. And I think you could see similar dynamics politically emerge in the future if, if, if we're not careful, if we don't think through these things. I mean, and one of the reasons central banks probably are independent today is to avoid going in, into this area where they know it's going to get political really quick if, if if everyone has access to its balance sheet. With that said, let me step back for just a minute. And I realize that we haven't defined what a central bank digital currency is. So maybe you could just give us your definition of what a central bank digital currency is. There are actually, I will say, two different versions. One will be what we call an account-based central bank digital currency. So this means you can log in into the web page of the Federal Reserve System. You can create an account. That account will have some deposits, will be just electronic money. And you can use that checking account to undertake payments like you will be able to use your checking account in your regular bank. So this is, I don't know, you have a checking account with with Wells Fargo. It will be exactly the same, except that now is the Fed. And the other difference is that there will be no in some extreme versions of this central bank digital currency, that will be a full substitute for cash. Other versions do not really have cash. Uh, sorry, they keep the cash. And the second possibility is to have something that is called a token base, the central bank digital currency. And this will be, if I can say it a little bit loosely, something like a federal government issue Bitcoin. So you create some type of uh, blockchain, except that now it's sponsored by the Federal Reserve System, and you participate in the blockchain or some other type of aggregate ledger, and you transfer, use um, that coin to transfer uh, and, and undertake payments. So the first one is, in some sense, much, much closer to just moving your checking account from your regular private bank to the Fed. 
The second one will be like generalizing Bitcoin at a higher level. Uh, my suspicion is that most policymakers are thinking about the account base central bank digital currency uh, because the token based digital car central bank digital currency just opens too many issues that I don't think they are very uh, beneficial and can be quite detrimental. So let me then stick with the account base. So the, the account based central bank digital currencies, as I was saying, in the same way that you can walk into your local commercial bank and say, hey, I'm David or I'm Jesus, I want to open a checking account over here, uh, you will be able to do that with the Fed. And, you know, uh, it will be uh, through the internet. And should we allow this? Should the Fed offer these deposit facilities to all residents in the United States? And that's what we are trying to, to think in, those two, in, this, in these two papers and think a little bit about their consequences. Yeah, and I think that version is what is getting most of the popular attention. I know academics are exploring more the Bitcoin version, but again, going back to my friend Morgan Ricks and his paper with his co-authors, his paper received a lot of attention. In fact, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren added it to a bill, and in fact, the early version of the CARES bill, the CARES Act that went through, the Democratic version of it actually had a Fed account in it. It got struck out before this the, the CARES Act passed. But this this idea has garnered a lot of support, at least on the left. So I, I think you're going down the right path looking at this version of it. So let's start with your first paper, Central Bank Digital Currency, Central Banking for All. And you build a model in it. So tell us a little bit about the model and, then, and tell us you know, what are the conclusions, what are the insights you get from it? Okay. So... Mm, let me first point out that like all papers, you pick a model and models have strengths and weaknesses. And the fact that I have a model and I'm going to develop some ideas in that model doesn't imply there are many other aspects of reality I'm forgetting, okay? So economics is, is built on abstraction. So I mentioned this, many many of, of your listeners may be, may be familiar with this, but others may be a little bit less familiar with that idea. So the, the framework, the, the modeling... Um, framework we are going to take is something called the diamond divic model which is a little bit the the, the workhorse of modern banking theory uh, it was proposed in the early 1980s by diamond and, and divic and you know there has been i don't know maybe 10,000 papers using variations of that model so we thought look this is the model that everyone understands that everyone loves or hates depending on your position and the good thing is that in that way your results will be very transparent everyone will be able to see them right away and this is a model that uh, highlights the role of financial intermediation and maturity transformation. And this, at the end of the day, that when I when I explain this to my my undergrads, I always tell them that this is a model of it's a wonderful life. You know, you remember when uh, you know there is this bank run and people are asking Jimmy Stewart for his money for their money, and and Stewart says, no, no, but it's in the it is in the house of this person or it's in the house of that other person. So you basically have short run deposits in the in the bank and what banks do is they package those short run deposits invest them in long run projects and that transform uh, that transformation of maturity uh, allows society to achieve things that otherwise will not be uh, feasible so then we basically modify the model by introducing a central bank and we ask the question well if this central bank allows these uh, checking accounts it will transform all the uh, maturity transformation in the economy. Do we get a better, a worse, or the same outcome that if we had not allowed that? Uh, the first result that we get is what we call an equivalence result. And it basically says that a central bank that is open to all, as long, and this is going to be very important, as long as it is not fiscally back. That means it doesn't have extra sources of revenue from the government. Will be able to deliver exactly the same allocation that commercial banks. Okay, so this is basically saying at the end of the day, the the Fed is not going to be able to do anything worse or better than commercial banks. And the intuition is very simple. Uh, basically, the Fed is going to be disciplined by commercial banks. If the Fed is offering a service that is much worse than commercial banks. No one will bank with the Fed, so it will be relevant. Whether or not the Fed has checking accounts will be relevant. 
if the Fed is trying to offer a better service, it's not going to be able to do it because where do the funds come? The competition will force banks to uh, offer the same type of service. So there is no reason why the Fed can't do any better. Now, this result will break down under two situations. One is when commercial banks have some type of monopoly power, and then the Fed can break into that monopoly power. Uh, how much of monopoly power banks have in the US or in a large economies? A little bit, but I don't think it's such an important issue. You know, I'm, I'm open to discuss this, this, this concern. The second one is if the Fed starts to get some type of fiscal backing from uh, the government, because then the Fed will be able to do other types of maturity transformation. And let me give you a very simple example. Um, so imagine that Senator Warren is able to convince the Senate to pass this legislation. And three months later, she comes up with the idea that if the Fed is going to engage in this type of central banking and you are making a deposit and it happens to be the case that you are a firm and that firm has achieved some goals in terms of climate change and CO2 reductions, you are going to get 25 extra basis points on your interest. And the, and the Congress is going to pay for those 25 extra basis points. Uh, that's when the equivalence results break. And what my concern is, is that the political process is going to generate exactly those type of uh, transfers. And, and it's not going to be most of, in most occasions, oh, I'm going to give money to the people I like. Most of the attempts at providing extra transfers are going to be very well intentioned. They are going to be, oh, if you are a firm that reduces CO2, I'm going to give you some special advantages. If you are a firm that makes progress in gender equality, I'm going to give you this extra money. If you are a firm that achieves some diversity goals, I'm going to give you this extra money. And before you realize, Congress is really directing a maturity transformation and a departing quite a lot from a standard market forces. And for those who think that this is an abstract concern, I will put two pieces of information. Again, I come from Spain. <laughs> I have seen, we used to have a very, very large public, uh, no, let me say it correctly, government-owned uh, banking sector and the investment and material transformation of these uh, government-owned banks was hugely determined by the political process. And I can tell you stories for the next 10 hours of your show. And second, because I have already seen uh, numerous letters written by academics and even economists in Europe right before the COVID-19 crisis that the European Central Bank should buy us all its lending facilities towards firms committed with climate change goals. And before you realize, as I was mentioning before, you are going to have a whole investment portfolio that is going to be dictated politically. Yeah. So every election, portfolios will swing one way or the other based on who's on who's in power. And that does that concerns me. I, I agree. Right before this crisis broke out, I was worried about all the push for using central banks to promote green investments as opposed to providing financial stability and the, the politicization of finance that you see it everywhere i mean there was a call not so long ago to restrict credit card use for gun purchases for example which you might be sympathetic to that but if that's the first chip to fall what's next what ne what's the next unpopular <laughs> transaction you could target I think your point is well taken. It's easy to see the central bank opening up its balance sheet becoming very politicized. In fact, the baseline case, in my mind, probably wouldn't last very long, if at all. <laughs> You'd quickly end up in this, this worst case. But let me ask a question about the baseline scenario where there is no special fiscal backing for the central bank. In the baseline case, if there's no fiscal backing for the central bank, nothing special about it, why would the central bank even be offering services? Why would anyone want it? If it's no different than any other bank, is right? why would it even emerge and take that role? Okay. So the, the second part of the paper then moves to address that question. Okay. Um, um, so in the basic diamond debit model, you have something called bank runs, which is basically an equilibrium where people want to redeem their savings, their deposits too early. 
and that forces the liquidation of long-run assets. And the advantage of a central bank is that because of a number of reasons, and I can explain those later if you want, it's going to be a little bit better to avoid some of those bank runs. So the idea will be that that central bank, as long as it could protect itself against political interference, will give extra stability to the financial system by lowering the probability of having a bank run. So there is a positive case for a CBDC. Uh, what you need to do is make a judgment call that to a large extent goes beyond what I can prove in terms of a theorem of what is going to be a more serious consideration in real life. The political pressure that you can get from the system, from Congress or the presidency, trying to interfere with the action of the Federal Reserve System or the advantages that you are going to get out of avoiding financial crisis with a higher probability. And that's a judgment call, and I can perfectly see two of your listeners coming up with diff- two different conclusions in that judgment call. And that is the one of the big appeals of this, right? That you would have a super safe checking account. You would never have to worry, like your grandmother, right? You would never have to worry about the, the, the ability of redeeming your account if you had your money, your funds parked at the central bank. And and there's been lots of calls for people who are unbanked right now. This would be great for them. So there's, I mean, a strong argument to make in terms of that. Let's let's transition to your second paper where you develop this argument even more. And the second paper is titled Central Bank Digital Currency in a Nominal World. And you really wrestle with this bank run problem. So tell us how this paper is different and what insights you get out of it. So the first paper, everything is real. Uh, all the contracts uh, denominated in real units. So I give you one banana and you're supposed to return to me two bananas tomorrow because the basic diamond Dibic model is a real model. However, most contracts in life are nominal contracts. I don't know if you have a mortgage, but you, if you do, you probably owe your bank, I don't know, $1,000 a month. You don't owe your I bank. have that, yes. <laughs> and, you, and you probably don't need to pay them 1,000 bananas. You need to pay them $1,000. Yep. So what we wanted to say is, can I extend the diamond Dibic model in such a way that most contracts are nominal and then kind of go over and the whole reasoning before, but in nominal terms. And this, of course, makes a huge difference because in the first model, the central bank is forced to give you back bananas. And if the central bank doesn't have enough bananas, yes, it can be the central bank, but it cannot be the banana. So think about banks under the gold standard. You are the Bank of England. This is September. So if I recall uh, correctly, the the United Kingdom left the gold standard on September 11, 1931. This is September the 10th, 1931. You are running out of gold. But now that everything is is nominal, it's not real. I don't need to give you gold. I need to give you uh, currency. I can always print more currency. In fact, since it's digital, the only thing I need to do is call the guy in IT and tell her, (laughs) <laughs> to put a zero more <laughs> right, in the right. account. So that's it. And so that ho- that completely changes uh, the, the situation. And that consequently completely changes the, uh, the characterization of the bank grants. So now, this is very interesting because what is going to happen is uh, the central bank can always honor its debts, its nominal debts, but it will generate inflation. Because I'm putting one more zero, of course, this is going to have a consequence in terms of the price level uh, going up. And what we show is under what I think is a set of reasonable policies by the government, precisely by threatening to create inflation after a bank run, you deter households from engaging into this run. And that really delivers a lot of financial stability. So by moving from a real model to a nominal model, we strengthen the case in favor of a central bank digital currency. Now, all the political considerations we discussed before are still there, but it's easier for a central bank doing nominal contracts and nominal deposits to avoid uh, bank runs. And to me, that was a very interesting result because 
before we brought the paper, uh, we brought the paper in February. I didn't even have this intuition whatsoever. If, if someone had told me this on February the 1st, I would be like, oh, wow, that's interesting. I never thought about it. And that's why I like this paper a lot. I, I, I think I learned something that I, I didn't know uh, at the beginning of the semester. And that's why we do models, right? The yeah. Insights fall out of the models you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And it also makes a stronger case for the central bank issuing digital currency. And as I mentioned to you before the show, when I read this, it, it what screamed at me was this is effectively nominal GDP level targeting because if you're threatening to raise inflation when there's a real shock, negative real shock, that's exactly what nominal GDP targeting does. So uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see something like nominal GDP targeting fall out of your model. And it just goes well with the recent research on nominal GDP targeting as a great risk-sharing device. But the but way you frame it, it, it's more than just that. It's, it's a signal. It's a discipline. It, it, it keeps spending stable in the first instance so people don't run. And that's, that's the for, almost like a forward guidance role you have in this paper. Exactly. So we don't make the explicit connection about the nominal GDP targeting. And I guess that when, re- when we revise the paper, we should make it because I, I, I agree with you 100%. But yes, it really, it really helped me thinking a little bit more about how important is the fact that nominal contracts really do make a difference in ways that go a little bit beyond you know, your boring New Keynesian model with sticky prices and sticky wages. So I, I, I written, I don't know, maybe two dozen papers using New Keynesian models. And it's always about, you know, you cannot adjust your prices that much, blah, 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 blah. Right. Fine. But this is, a, a, in, in some sense, a little bit much more fundamental. And the fact that your contracts are nominal and you have financial intermediation really pushes you in a full, completely different world. And maybe some economists will say, well, we have known that since 1930, and <laughs> I will agree with that. But, you know, it's, it's the realization. When it comes from your model, it's a little bit of an epiphany that uh, is different than when you are sitting in class and your, your professor is telling you when you're in the first year graduate class. It's, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if it happens to you or not, but whenever a result comes of my own paper, Suddenly you are, oh, now I understand <laughs> what they were telling me when I was a freshman. <laughs> right, no. Sometimes you, you have to educate yourself the hard way, working through a model, thinking through something. But no, I, I completely agree with you. And I, and I had Evan Koenig from the Dallas Fed, and he's written on a related area. Again, he, he's written on the nominal income targeting, nominal GDP targeting as a form of risk sharing. And and he came onto the show, and, and he's worked on these models too. And he goes, one of the big challenges that we face in our profession is kind of the workhorse New Keynesian model. It's all about pr- output price stickiness. There, there's some wage stickiness as well in there, but often it's you know the Calvo pricing model. So it's it's all about price rigidity as being the main friction. Where he goes, really, what matters a lot is nominal debt uh, rigidities. You know, we can't quickly renegotiate your mortgage. Those are the things that really matter and have huge consequences. We saw that in 2008, as you mentioned, in the Great Depression. It's just that our models haven't incorporated that that friction as much as maybe they should have. So in that sense, I have been playing with a colleague of mine, Guillermo Ordóñez at Penn, for like five years on a paper that we have not finished and we should finish one day. And over there, we argue that renegotiating contracts is costly and in addition to it, you don't want to be the first that renegotiates the contract. So imagine that your bank has a mortgage to you and with your neighbor. So you don't want to be the first that renegotiates the mortgage with the bank because then who knows, uh, maybe the bank will offer a better deal to the second person or the other way around. Interesting. And inflation is a way to renegotiate all nominal contracts in the economy at the same time. Huh. So instead of having to go through the mess, imagine that... It will be better if all the debts, we get out of this crisis and it will be better if all debts and all nominal contracts get reduced, get a 5% haircut. Yep. Very difficult. You know, even if yes, because we are going to make a small army of lawyers rich. Well, <laughs> the Fed comes, gets a 5% inflation that is unexpected. Well, that's a 5% haircut. Right. No, we don't need more lawyers. We do it in a second. And that's a little bit the intuition of what is in my paper, in my second paper with with my co-authors. Yeah, and that, again, speaks to the benefit of having counter-cyclical inflation. Um, it, it, it serves a use, very useful purpose. 
And I'm glad to hear that you're working on this too, because you're a pretty well-known modeler, so you can get the momentum going. Jesus, that would be great. So well, we have a few minutes left. I just want to touch base with your thoughts on Europe. Um, you're from Spain. You've written about the Eurozone. You care about it immensely. You have family there. So, so any more thoughts on what's happening in Europe in response to the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, yes. So the situation right now is pretty bad. I'm not going to put it in any other way. We were very unlucky because the country that got hit the first and to a very large extent the most is Italy. Italy was the weakest link in the Eurozone, and a lot of people had made that point because in comparison with Spain, they had not really put their house in order. In the sense that if you look at Spain in 2019, in fact, already by 2016, 2017, wages and prices and real estate values were back in order. Okay, so it was it was painful, it was difficult. We had way more unemployment than we should have had under a better policy, but we porch, if I can say it in that sense, the problems from the system. Italy had not done that. So precisely in the country that you have the weakest link is the country where now the rich regions, which is Lombardy, uh, Veneto, and, and, and the rest of the north are particularly hit by the epidemic. And in addition to it, I think there is a feeling within Italy that they have not been helped enough by the rest of Europe. So you are on one hand, a country that is already in a very weakened position with a tremendous financial and economic crisis and very, very much unhappiness about the reactions of of Europeans about this. And either the European Union is way more proactive in trying to uh, share risk in the right way or or this just cannot continue. Something is going to to blow up uh, sooner or later. On the other hand, I also understand a little bit the argument of the Germans because they are going to tell countries like Spain or Italy that we had relatively eight good years between 2012, 2013 and early 2020 and we did very little to prepare ourselves for the future. I gave a very large talk, public talk in in Spain in May 2019 and I was going in some detail about how our fiscal situation was really very, very weak. And I say, we are going to have a crisis. I promise you we are going to have a crisis. I just don't know where this crisis is going to come from. And when that crisis comes, we are really, really, really going to be close to the limit of what we can borrow. And that's exactly what we are now. So the Germans and the Dutch are a little bit reluctant to lend to us on the other hand, I think this is a perfect example of a situation where they should lend to us. I mean, to us, I mean Spain and Italy, uh, because this is not really our fault in the sense that it's not that we created this virus ourselves. So this is going to generate huge amounts of unhappiness in the European Union. And I really hope the European leaders will be able to find a path forward. On that dimension, I'm actually relatively pessimistic. I, I hope that you know, in one year when we talk again, I can report better news. But right now, I, I, I really see a conundrum. I don't, I don't really see an easy way out of this situation. So could this crisis be the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of the Eurozone? So we, we thought, many of people thought that uh, the Eurozone crisis would break up the Eurozone, or at least Greece might leave. That never happened, which was remarkable. Shows the commitment of the Europeans to this project. But maybe we're getting close to a tipping point? In Italy, I think so. Um, something that was not sufficiently appreciated by American, or let me say more general, English-speaking commentators is that in countries such as Greece and Spain, being part of the Euro and the European Union was a commitment never to go back to the dictatorships we have in the 1970s. Okay. And I say that during the financial crisis, and some people, you know, very famous, prominent figures of this profession Never believe me, but I told them, look, you talk to the generation of my parents, they grew in a dictatorship, and they are more than willing to eat grass, if necessary, never to go back to a dictatorship. That means that if you need to be in the euro and you are going to eat white steamed rice for a year, you are going to (laughs) eat white steamed rice. Wow. Now, Italy is different because Italy dictatorship ended in parts of the country in 1943 and in the north in 1945. 
So this idea of a dictatorship and euro as the solution to your dictatorship is not that valid anymore. And then a lot of people may be tempted to say, maybe we can go along. Look at the British, they are going along and it's okay, they are not collapsing. And that's what really, really worries me. So if I were going to give you probabilities, I will give a 35% probability to Italians doing something really nasty at the end of this of this crisis, unless the European Union offers some type of mutualization of debt and the cost of the crisis. Well, that would be bad news for the rest of us too, because if, if that happened, then it would be just an intense financial crisis globally on top of everything else that we're going through right now. So let's hope it doesn't come to, let's hope the leadership steps up to the plate in the Eurozone and delivers. Well, yes. Okay, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Jesus Pereverde Fernandez. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Okay, thank you. It was a, a lot of fun to be back. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>